software applications to have quantitative intelligence, to read and write in the new internet, rather than reading and writing for books, <clears throat> for learning how to think in 3D. One of my big lectures in my class is thinking in 3D, because my students have a tendency to think in 2D, slapping up PowerPoint slides and slapping up text in virtual worlds, when they should be learning how to program objects to get people to act procedurally. But look at this, 2.3 billion users on the internet right now. And of course, the disenfranchised that aren't on the internet, I'm less concerned about them because we have 2.3 billion people that are going to help those disenfranchised people get on the internet. So that's a lot different than it was in 1999. And then also take a look, this is, a, and I love this surprise here with the countries, as you have countries like Nigeria popping up at number five on hardcore users. So we really are um, establishing borderless, uh, resident uh, free um, nations and um, schools and services because of this disappearance of these older um, forms of um, institutions and preparing ourselves for the new virtual forms. Look how much we've done already. Um, shout out again in chat because I don't want to ever have you left behind. What are the four technologies that I've got up here that have converged into the iPhone? I don't know about you, I've been a lot around since the 90s, uh, since the 60s. Uh, don't you think it's impressive that the cell phone is not a telephone? It's not even close to a telephone. Um, it's a Rolodex. It's a compass. It's a map. It's a camera. I mean, what else is it? What application are you using today that, no, that you never thought you would be using with your with with your electronic device, babysitter for restless kids, a wonderful tracking device. How are you using it for health? I'm going to take a sip of my coffee while you put some answers in there. What 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 else is astonishing? Mm hmm. Look how some of your answers are paper-based. So paper's getting replaced. Some of your answers are mechanical. So a lot of mechanical devices like a watch are getting replaced. Has anyone taken a picture of food and sent it off to an application to find out what its caloric content is? Where you're having the phone transform 3D images into data? Why you've got that in mind, and if any of you are in the room or developers, another one of the things that Mary talked about that were so interesting to me was um, which one of these devices um, really changed the, um, is changing the future. And just um, shout out who you think really is ramped up faster, the iPhone or the Android, into putting these, these um, type of applications out on the market. And this is important if you're thinking about creating applications in, um, in the, uh, for the Internet and you're thinking about platform. And then notice another phenomena as well, this other phenomena of people not um, wanting to move too quickly outside of the comfort zone of what other people are answering. So when you get a whole bunch of people that are saying Android, 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 are you iPhone users out there um, thinking that maybe they're right? Or are you thinking strongly, no, they're wrong, it's the iPhone, and I'm going to put some statistics up into the chat so people know the answer. Well, let me help you do that. Look at the green is the Android, and look at that meteoric rise. So the cell phone, which is a strange name, is a device that is going to make us highly interactive. And this thing is going to turn into video conferencing. It's going to turn into virtual interaction and, and augmented reality. And it's going to um, create environments like Second Life. You can see me talking to one of my uh, Chinese students. Um, 
uh, taking environments like that and pushing all of this into getting virtual environments. And virtuality is a bigger word than virtual worlds because we're not only bringing the world to you, but we're bringing literally information into the palm of your hand so that it is so accessible and so embedded with you that it changes the way you communicate. Um, just a few more questions. What, when, when did mobile internet usage surpass desktop internet usage? Because I want to prove to you that although we are sitting in front of our computers, that is not the majority of people sitting in front of their computers entering into a virtual world. So virtual worlds have to go to the browser. The interaction models for talking with people and moving around in the environment have to change and we need very innovative people thinking how this works so we're not just talking to each other and we're using some of these techniques like are you really paying attention to me through your avatar and i moved already just in case any of you were uh, noticed um that is may 2012 so just less than a year ago cell phone um, usage surpassed the internet. So what, what do you need to know? I've come up with 10 things you need to know um, to get you from 940 to 10 o'clock and start thinking about how to increase your VQ. Because I think you're up to kind of understanding, you probably know already, you probably have a sense already, um, how your avatar is really acting in the environment is this next stage that I want to talk about. And there are people in the room who know about avatar interaction. But um, the first thing that you need to really know is um, what's the history of interactivity? And there's Tim Berners lay up on the top if you don't recognize him, and what I call the new Stonehenge on the bottom. But you have to know the history and you have to see where we came from and how we progressed and how we've been trying to get people to be virtual for a real long time. Now there's a huge demand on how this is supposed to work very effectively. And, uh, you know, reading the research, the Journal of Virtual Worlds Research uh, is a really good um, magazine. Looking at human-computer interface technology is another good way of looking how interactivity happens. But really starting to change the way you experience these environments and the way you use them as you drive the research. So you start be, uh, taking this information and putting it into new behaviors. And then you start to envision how you can use the technology. Um, key to making this all really work is realism. I don't know, does anyone know that picture on the top of my cell phone on the left-hand side? One of those people is real and one of them is not real. And in order to get people to start interacting with you psychologically, sociologically, and biologically, we have to add realism to these environments. checking the text just to see if anybody who knows which one is the guy on the left reel or is the guy on the right wheel real because we we really have this is the geminoid project in um uh university of keio in um japan uh called geminoid but um we're getting very very close to imitating realism uh with physical robots remember how we got uh, around the 80s, we became using control processing. We got very good at taking artificial intelligence and using it on robots. And then artificial intelligence became a thing of language and um, reasoning and uh, communication. Well, we're going to see the same thing here, robots to avatars. So our avatars have to become real. But you have to understand this concept of the uncanny valley. And I told you this was coming. Does anybody have a definition for the uncanny valley? Because you can see that big dip that suggests that the closer we get to real and it doesn't look just exactly right, the more afraid we are of the technology. And that is something that you have to avoid when working with avatars, when working with um, virtual environments, is you have to understand when to use fantasy and when to use reality and how people are interacting with it. <clears throat> VQ2. Serious gaming is no joke. Inside of gaming are the principles of interaction. Byron Reeves' book on total engagement, Carl Kapp's book on uh, gamification, the techniques for engaging people, 
um, using point systems and reputation systems. Th this is not stuff to talk about. This is stuff to build inside of the virtual environment so that people feel a sense of accomplishment. They feel a sense of um, problem solving. Hey, um, Dan? Yes, please. What do you think of the new um, term competition-based learning? And I've been doing a lot, there isn't a lot of research out on it yet, and what I'm seeing is mostly in the academic circles where they take teams within the university setting and have them compete to, you know, on a design. It's like engineering sort of elements. So I'm curious if you've looked at that and how we then do that from a virtual standpoint to do this competition-based learning. I think that uh, it's a good insight to start thinking about um, getting people to problem solve together because it's a skill that we're looking for in industry. So um, whether it's adversarial learning or avatar collaborative learning or anything that deals with people having to do something like the very bottom line of that as you read in um, um, light sequence work or you look at Tony O'Driscoll's work with Carl Kapp and you look at scavenger hunting, very basic form of engaging people in the environment where we go find the five things that are going to build the motor that we're going to put in the front of the classroom. So I think it's a good idea. And um, the only thing that we have to keep in mind when we start thinking about busting out in competition and adversarial serious environments is some cultures are not attuned to doing that. But you know what? It, um, I think that it's part of adjusting to the culture of virtual spaces. So I think we're going to look for mechanisms to, to bring those cultures into uh, serious gaming in the environment. Um, Metaverse paper that talks about how we're really going to get this stuff working so that it's effective is that we also have to be able to scale so that we can um, have these um, uh, content move from paper drawings to graphics to actual simulated events. This is kind of me going from the origin of species to looking at um, diagrams in a book to actually being embedded in Jurassic Park and learning how to survive in the environment. So we have to think about how to do this. Um, we know a lot about avatar psychology. If you've seen um, Blaskovich and Bailitzen's book, Infinite Reality, they quote quite a lot of uh, studies that were done that are um, famous both psychological studies and um, sociological studies and questioning whether these same things that happen in the physical environment or not. So there is a psychology that's emerging um, that you have to be aware of in the environment and you need to know things like stigma, ostracism, height, uh, positioning in the environment, how close you are to somebody, um, uh, eye gaze, all of this has meaning in these environments and you have to figure out how to integrate that uh, into your learning products so that they're meaningful. Avatar development, this is becoming more and more of a thing that I uh, find um, in working with people for long periods of time within virtual environments, is that people have to develop. Their cognition actually has to develop, and they go through different stages. Leslie uh, talks about this in one way. I started to move around. There are four things that really happen here in this environment, and you're all engaged in this first stage of development, is that it's... It, it, your presence is identified in the environment. You are um, here and um, your competence is seen that you showed up in a virtual environment. How you're performing has been spinning out a little bit in the text chat and uh, then one person actually used voice chat uh, because it's available to you. Um, so that's your next level is how you're performing in the environment. Sooner or later you're going to evolve to this state where your avatar is you and your avatar is going to be responsible for communicating information that isn't being voiced, um, you know, through text or, um, um, you know, through data. It's going to be done through gestures. It's going to be done through where you're located, how you move. When you go and assume uh, a position, for example, in a classroom and you go up to um, the podium, it's very clear that you are in control. You are the authority and people look at you as the authority. And as long as you stand up here, people don't question you. Um, 
Here's another thing that I've seen by crossing many virtual worlds is students demand to have web access in these environments. You've got to get that. Find those environments that have web on a prim and use that uh, information in the environment and get everybody reading the same thing, using the whiteboarding in the environment to write on it and engage these folks in doing stuff. In the uh, lower corner, you've got a person building a uh, or putting together a, a VC, well, VCR is an old word, DVR. And in the picture on the right hand side, you have per, a person actually engaged in a physical inventory. And the more you can do this, the more you can track what your users are doing. And you'll, you're going to be moving away from evaluating people and their ability to answer questions in chat with facts to actually measuring their performance. So what do we need to do? And here's some uh, of the VQ suggestions that I have to get you focused in this environment, to move you from just thinking about it and looking at the environment to actually doing something in here to really uh, change the way things are happening. Start working in virtual offices. Um, if you're going to work in a virtual office, you're going to evolve it like this one. This is my office. I have several offices in different platforms, but the one I use the most is in Second Life because I, it's free to everybody who wants to download it. And second of all, I can turn every surface into a programmed environment. So on the left-hand side, I have an agenda. In the middle, I have a PowerPoint presentation uh, or a video running. On the right, I have a whiteboard. I can program all the objects in the chair so I can focus people's attention and have them press a button to move around uh, their tension around. I can integrate cloud-based applications. I can call groups of people from other locations. The more you work virtually and find a place for you to live in the environment and you have people visit you, the higher your VQ. Notice your VQ is up in the eight range now because if you work in the environment, you can call on people in the environment. One of the things Anders did so effortlessly was just, hey, Ran, you're in a virtual world. You want to come and hang out with me for an hour? on Thursday at 10 o'clock um, using his virtual network. When you're building in the environment, you can pull in people and prototype and say, how would you like um, us to um, have people get out of this Jeep, uh, this um, military vehicle once they go through the PTSD uh, simulation that we've built on PTSD Island. And so up comes the clinician, gives me an advice on what would happen next. So you have dynamic programming happening in the environment when you work with me mental avatars or your mentor network. And then start thinking about this because I think that uh, getting data is going to be huge and you have to start thinking about how to get data from people. I work in clinical a lot, so I'm trying to think of how to get bio information from people so I can tell whether they're sweating, their pulses beating, their, their bodies moving. So think about when preparing in this environment for this advent of wearables that's coming, you know, Nokia with its tattoo, Google with its glasses, uh, augmented reality on pretty much every device that you're going to have working with you. And these are part of the immersive equation as well. And then it's even going to go faster than that. I'm looking, I spend a lot of time in uh, research facilities around the world. And I'm seeing, for example, in the upper left here, Google's playing with glass at the point where um, information is literally going to be on every surface. Microsoft is playing with software. So um, you can tell something like the temperature of a cup uh, the contents of the liquid inside your cup. So every device is going to have um, an IP address and probably sensing what's going on in the environment. And I borrow Tony O'Driscoll's word, internet, just for the fun here, is that you will be immersed in the internet everywhere you go, uh, including using an emotive device at the bottom where you think and you move. So we're starting to tap into some, some uh, concepts that, um, are really going to propel us into the future. And that's Tupac, of course, uh, singing with Snoop Dogg. And if you haven't seen that hologram uh, presentation on YouTube yet, you should see what happens when you start creating what you will now hear as a 4D technology, where you're bringing people out of time to interact with people in time in new environments. And these guys are rap singing uh, in this environment. So I'm going to go through this just super quickly, and I'm not really going to look for your answers. But historically, you know, the sensorama 
uh, it started in 1956 where people really tried to immerse people in these machines that look like arcades uh, to get people to be immersed. In 1968, people were playing with virtual reality and immersing themselves. You may have seen the ocular rifts, so we're going back to that. So you're gonna see a lot of people expanding their virtuality with hardware devices. This concept of chatting is not new either, but it's highly powerful. And the more you use it in meaningful ways where you begin dialogues and then record those dialogues and objects, the, the more you're going to expand your virtual VQ. Um, I think that you also wanna train people um, when they, they type in chat to build um, story in the chat, when people just um, throw out social conversation and they don't stay within uh, the context of the conversation with each other, they create the schizophrenic environment that is almost worthless to us. Uh, if you start training people to, to build a narrative and a story of what we're talking about today, um, we can use those artifacts and store them in provenance uh, so that we can have our intelligence built with us. Um, you know, uh, I throw Tron in here because I think that uh, CGI is going to be the next competency. So being able to build very interactive environments is highly important. Um, this started as early as 1986 when uh, a chip uh, morning chip and uh, Randy Randy Farmer and Chip Morningstar created the habitat, which is uh, the first thing that you know is a virtual world. And um, uh, Neil Stevenson spoke of the metaverse, and this is something that you should be assigned to people to read, um, because what happens when you really are truly immersed and it's almost a Don Quixote like environment where you can't figure out one thing versus another. The trend being content creation, and this was enabled by Alpha World in 1995. Uh, a little bit more in the history of this to make sure that you understand what we're reaching for is in 2005, which is nearly uh, eight years ago, Linden was pulling in the bucks, and they still are pulling in the bucks, just selling silly little virtual objects in the space. This means that the objects are going to have more value over time, the more they interoperate across different platforms and plug directly into other objects within the 3D environment, like Google Sketch is imagining, uh, then the more the transaction value changes, and this drives business transaction um, in also drives uh, communication with this in the environment, and so you can start making the virtual worlds far more effective. Um, open source has um, decentralized um, computing, so that we're going to accelerate at a pace here. The uh, virtual world framework written in HTML5 is probably a very promising environment that's going to allow this to happen at a very enormous pace. So start looking at the environments that are open source for developing this. I just want to also talk to you as the time wanes here, that there's some things that are emerging that you want to think about, about um, uh, how this is all going to get aggregated. Um, avatars really are going to inherit DNA from each other. And I think people are going to be able to express themselves past their life through this concept of genetic programming. You, you might know it as object-oriented programming now, but everything your avatar knows and your avatar's inventory and all of the uh, experiences that your avatar has had should be transportable to your next avatar and should be packageable to sell to other avatars because there's a lot of experience that you develop in virtual environments that have meaning that will actually be part of inquiry and part of discovery. Um, big data is becoming so enormous when you look at, um, you know, uh, just how much, how many, I, I don't even know the number of bytes anymore. They're just so big now, extabytes and, you know, Jupiter bytes that are um, appearing that give us the ability to analyze these data and look at trends using our artificial intelligence is another area that you're going to be seeing grow very largely in the future. And as is um, biology and nano integrating and creating what we will call educational markers, kind of like the biomarkers that exist today in our genetic code, but there's no reason that we cannot program DNA. Um, 
My messaging was basically remember your general intelligence and all of the competencies that are around that, from crystallizing your knowledge to the reaction time in virtual environments. Think in terms of verbs, immerse yourself, engage and virtualize and converge the technologies, measure everything and start thinking in 3D. Um, I'll go back to the slide when I'm done, but the, a lot of the references that I did are in YouTube's. To, you've got to see the Tupac and Snoop Dogg video if you just want to see how unbelievable it's becoming. Uh, we put together a video on how to do government conferences because we see that this is becoming, because of sequestration, a huge issue. So thinking about how to do conferences in this world is more than just appearing on a screen. we got to bring people to a new level of interactivity. Um, the whole purpose for this for me is sustainability. I don't drive. I don't travel on an airplane very much. I have much more powerful experiences uh, as a company. Uh, we have our studios in world. We design in world for um, uh, interacting with people. And that is the direction that we think that virtual uh, intelligence is going in um, 2014. So that's what I came to tell you this morning. I hope that's what you wanted to hear. I'm available for questions. Hey, can you put your top 10 list back up, please? Did you say something? I, I heard somebody say I something, did. but, no, oh. Said, oh. Can you, you said you would put your list back up again. Okay, great. I started with Remember Your G. Yeah, let me back up to that one. Thank you. Let me figure, oh, I have to hit Escape probably, and then click it, right click it, previous page, <laughs> yeah. previous page, okay. So. One of the side chats that we were we were having, we, we were um, talking about even as a work workplace, how bosses and supervisors need to get to a new place of understanding how to evaluate employees when they can't physically see them, and how I think virtual worlds. If you all want to show up, I mean, if you feel like you have to see somebody. We can all show up and we can all virtually walk down our corridor and see, oh, look who's in, or we can have chats that way. So we're starting to see a little bit of that, but one wonders how that transfers over into the learning environment for students. How can we get the professors and the teachers to think about how students um, learn and interact when they can't physically see them? It's a whole cultural shift that needs to occur. Any suggestions for that? Yeah, I think by um, students having um, places that they own in the virtual space where it's their office and they're building something, then they start building this need to um, show what it is they're learning and um, focus on um, performance. I want to see videos that you've done. I want to see objects that you've built. I want to see meetings that you've had. I can, I want to click on a, a a file um, cabinet that you have and open it up and see daily meetings. I want to see your cloud applications. Um, the more that you have this kind of known presence in the environment, the more you can begin to see how these people are progressing uh, within the virtual environment. And virtual environments, by the way, include wikis as well and those sorts of things. But my advice is start creating places for people where they show up. Yeah, what do you make out of uh, several references here in chat to the Yahoo announcement that they were going to force everyone to come into the office? That seems like a giant leap backwards, doesn't it? Well, I thought Yahoo's been backwards for many, many years now. The fact that Microsoft wouldn't buy them was no surprise to me. It's it's a draconian measure to cut back on employees is, is the major reason. And I, I, will, I don't trust them as an Internet company as a result. Look at Cisco. Look at Amazon, look at Microsoft. These basically are um, ghost towns of buildings where people um, aren't there. They're working from home and I hear dogs bark and uh, I don't hear babies crying. I hear happy babies in the background because their parents are with them. So um, I lean towards the culture that's evolving, not the one that's devolving. Yeah, agreed. It was interesting that it had such an impact in uh, mainstream media, the CNN, and everyone's debating it. So. It's the new victim. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? This is a really great time to uh, extract expertise out of people when you're in an environment of this l illustrious of individuals. 
Do you want us to raise our hand or do you just want to try to jump? <laughs> oh, just, just shout out and then I'll move over to you as soon as I find you. So I knew what you were doing a couple of years ago with the Naval Pacific Laboratory, I think it was. And because I'm more engaged in the cybersecurity world, you may have some recollections of this and you guys created some stuff. How are you, I, I've heard some ideas about how you get your students engaged, you have them create their own environment. And how do you encourage them to work as teams and to um, collaborate as teams together? Um, many, many projects. This is Disney's concept of imagineering uh, and also seen at Carnegie Mellon University where you have a lot of mini projects where you start building people up to learn how to work together and give them a methodology for doing that. Um, there are agile software methods that um, we've developed where you do your scrum um, experiences by having your avatar walk on a, a hopscotch that says, now define your problem, now explain what your blockers are, and move your avatar across the hopscotch so we know that you're moving from one thing to another, uh, and then time them. And then use lots of physical objects within the environment to get people to kind of play like this. Um, the other thing that we do a lot is we create stations so people move from station one to station two to station three um, and um, engage in activities. And then when they finally get to through all those stages, they move to another complete level and they engage in something that isn't so linear. Now they do um, something that's a little bit more broader where they go out and collect information or collect objects or collect people. And then also get people practicing a lot on forming groups. Teach them how to do ad hoc telephone conversations, uh, put up uh, screens where they whiteboard together, and then go evaluate how each one of them did that and have them report back how they uh, operate as groups within the virtual environment and they teach each other. All right, so I was just having this really bad image of, let's do the one where we all fall back and catch you, and ha-ha, we drop you in the avatar call. Um, so, Never would do that. If, if you aren't creating knowledge objects that are useful for people tomorrow, <laughs> then you probably shouldn't be engaged in the activity, right? Because this, this is more about how to use a whiteboard effectively. Um, I have an exercise that I ask people, how do I know who's speaking? So I've had every one of my students figure out a different way of saying I'm the one that's in control now. Somebody had, creates a big box and throws it on the ground and makes it flash and then everybody knows, you know, look for the big red box. So I think if you ask people to create solutions, you get better engagement from them. So in the 2012 uh, Gartner hype cycle report, uh, virtual worlds were shown as emerging from the trough of disillusionment and moving up to the plateau of productivity. Do you anticipate in the 2013 report that progression is going to continue or are virtual worlds going to disappear from there? I, 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 I think, of course, that um, sequestration equals uh, simulation. <laughs> That's my best way of saying it. I'm seeing more people pop up in line. I'm seeing more activity happen across multiple virtual environments. And everybody I know from in Second Life that used to be there is back. <laughs> Um, we need we, we need to be blogging on that sequestration equals simulation. I like that. That's a, yeah. a catchphrase. Yeah. <laughs> and Ran, Ran, you're you're a marvel of uh, of uh, <laughs> catchphrases. I remember your uh, keynote a couple of years ago. Uh, it was the uh, I still have it memorized. It's the uh, it's not about the database, it's about the human race. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Susan, you were saying? <laughs> yes, I have somebody else was saying something. Go ahead. I lost my thought. <laughs> <laughs> let's see, let's look around and see if we can find it here. I know it's dropped somewhere around here, maybe <laughs> over by this green line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The sequestration, <laughs> and here's my fear, is that, it, and I, I absolutely would rather you come out with the tagline that you've just said, versus where folks tend to think of, we're going to reduce travel, 
Great, we're going to reduce travel. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put you on an Adobe webinar. Or we're, not to say anything's bad about Adobe webinars, but there's a immersion that gets lost. There's an ability to connect. Part of why we do learning and training at the adult level is the networking that occurs within our community. And we need to start to build that community. And when you're in that flat environment such as Adobe, and I'm not, and I'm not, Adobe has this purpose, but we don't, um, people aren't as, as um, encouraged to communicate, I think, as if when you're in this virtual world. So we have to really focus on how we change the methodology, not to just the flat 2D computer-based online training that we see and how to get it into actually using simulation in this world. Did, does that make sense? It does. And um, like it, it, I, my biggest metaphor is go is think about how you learn a foreign language. You know, you drop yourself down in an airport in Barcelona, and the first thing you have to do is start reading Catalan and figuring out where to get a cup of coffee. And then you got to get a taxi, and then you got to start – uh, meandering through all of the different kinds of data that's being fed at you. And I think that you feel like a child in that environment and you have to rely on a lot of other people. I think that we're here in virtual environments the same way. We, this is why I bring up this thing of what is your VQ. So you realize that you've got to evolve in the environment, but you're going to have to accept the fact that you're, you know, we're, we're newbies in this environment. We got to learn how to do it effectively. What we know about instructional design hasn't changed. We just have to port those great qualities over to this environment. We, we can go ahead and hug our wikis and our, tests and anything and just think about ways to virtualize them and then start saying well i want to grow away from this we don't move enough we don't um participate in groups enough none of us are building anything and then start building those skill sets so i think that it's okay to use um uh, Adobe Connect, just start using it like I did today if, as an example of just engaging people with some questions and forcing people to use the environment. Use silence, wonderful technique to make sure people are responding. But build them up, give them a little bit of skill, and then stretch them every time you meet with them. I know we're way over our hour, but I'd love to get the, your response to Stiliana's question about your, your take on uh, this uh, op uh, massively open online course movement. Well, I, I, um, I, I love the concept because um, uh, <laughs> it uh, is allowing freedom of knowledge to appear in the world. So I love that aspect of it. I just saw a Simpson sign yesterday that when people were going into the airport is, let us make sure that we can probe you to assure your freedom. <laughs> and I laughed at that because I started thinking about how um, the, the MOOCs are allowing the freedom of access to content, but they're certainly not going to the next level of freeing the individual to interact with the content. And this is where the opportunity is for every single person standing here, is how can we take that wealth of data that is being put out there by Princeton and Harvard and MIT, and how can we make it more interactive so that it then we start adding the value to it. And I see that there's just huge business opportunities in this space. And um, I welcome anyone to call me, 2B3D, to help you figure that out. Call anyone else in the room who's got some uh, expertise in that direction. Read some of the books that we've got up. Um, you know, uh, enroll into my University of Washington class, which uh, runs for three quarters, and you practice it there ad nauseum. Um, you have Stelianos and Lucas who've been through that course already so that they can give you some more input. But engage. That's how. Hi, Stelianos. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. Hey, thank you so much, Ram. This was w wonderful uh, expose over uh, what's going on in, in, in our world. Uh, and thank you for the great work, and uh, thank you for the, the teaching. I uh, had a uh, great honor to participate in the class presentation last year. I'd love to come back and see what you, your students are, are, are doing. And thanks for your evangelizing uh, this message in such an articulate and engaging way. So. Thanks, everyone, and uh, hope to see you all back here next week. We're going to have uh, Chuck Hamilton from IBM here. We're going to be uh, here in this environment for the next few weeks. Yeah, we have a speaker from Microsoft and uh, Defense Acquisition University, and Roger Schrank is going to be here as well. So we have a great schedule lined up. 
uh, we're on Facebook and we started a Google community page, uh, Google Plus community page to where you can find the schedule. Very so, nice. Uh, well, that's great. Thank you for inviting me, and it's great to be amongst a, a group of um, uh, innovators and uh, experts in the area. So, it's a pleasure. Hey, thanks. Feel free to check out the area here uh, to exit. It's, you just hit escape key and then just press the browser down.